getting slowed down in the process of development is sort of the worst thing you can do because the game development is all about trying things because so many you you often just don't even know what's going to work i mean it is a bit of a black art yeah that's right and, and that's why getting to that finish line is super super important not just from a an application world this is this is product market fit or whatever yeah right? exactly the, exactly you don't, you don't know if you built something valuable yet and so you just seem to be able to, to optimize for for speed In this episode of Building the Metaverse with John Radoff, John sits down with Keith Adams and Ali L. Ramul. Keith was the chief architect at Slack and was accountable for Slack's overall technical strategy during a period of rapid growth in users, load, and engineering team size. Ali is the co-founder and CTO at Beamable. Let's jump into this fireside chat. All right, everyone, welcome back to Building the Metaverse. This is a first for building the metaverse because we are going to have a fireside chat, not with one other person, but two other people, two people who I really respect, one who I've worked with for the better part of a decade and one who I've worked with for part of a year. And I'm learning stuff all the time. And we're going to talk about what's involved in scaling up really big technology applications and also games. So let's start there because, you know, we live in a day now where like a lot has changed, like apps, games, they can get really big, really fast. It's always kind of been the case, but the rate at which things grow can, has been actually accelerating. And also what I see is the customer has changed as well. Like it used to be that you could kind of ship your rinky dink beta and if it broke a whole bunch. People kind of tolerate it. If it was cool enough, they'd, they'd give you that runway to come back and, you know, fix things. Today, that could be like the death knell of your company you ship and it doesn't break. Like people never come back. So a lot has changed that's really driving us to think more about how can things be reliable, performant, how can they scale, and what does it mean for, you know, exponential leaps in data, users, traffic, API calls, all of that stuff. So. Just to now dive into this topic, let's maybe start with, you know, apps versus games because they're a little bit different. But Keith, you know, I thought it would be really cool to start with you because Slack started as a game company, right? And then they pivoted to what we all know of Slack as now, and you had to deal with all kinds of interesting issues there. So, like, what was the whole background of that? Yeah, and I should say, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a founder of Slack. I was chief architect there from 2016 forward, but uh, to 2020. But you know, they'd have product market fit and stuff, and they'd figured out what Slack was by then. So, um, but you know, the the shaggy dog story around Slack, and I think there's actually some. This is usually told as just a funky anecdote or whatever. Um, but that the founders, uh, Stuart Butterfield um, and his his merry band of pranksters, wanted to create um, a massively multiplayer online game. Um, this was sort of in the golden age of, of social gaming, or this is sort of in the era when those were getting really well funded. Um, and they did a very interesting game. Um, it was uh, called Glitch. It was before Glitch was associated with a bunch of other projects. And uh, the company's called Tiny Spec. Um, they got to sort of tens of thousands of, of users, and there just were signs that it wasn't going to happen, right? It wasn't going to work. Um, they started laying people off, started giving investors their money back. And in the process, sort of looked at assets they had. They had all this art. They had all this music. Maybe they could sell that. Um, they also had built this internal um, sort of duct tape and bailing wire version of a persistence layer on top of IRC, right? So IRC it was this way of interacting in real time that technical people have been using for a long time. It had this kind of terrible shortcoming that it's not persistent, right? If you don't happen to be online when you see something, um, it didn't happen. Um, sometimes people approach that by like having little bot listeners that record and stuff like that and, and build search indices and so on. Um, by the way, there's a, there's a kind of canard about Slack that it's actually based on IRC technology. Um, there's no kind of the protocol IRC isn't involved in, in the product Slack and, and never was. Um, so the system that they built was um, 
was part of an early generation of better real-time web tools that were coming out at the time, partly enabled by WebSockets, by the way. WebSockets were sort of new at the time. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a really good way to do push in a web app before then. Um, and anyway, so people usually tell this as like a funny anecdote, or if it's in a VC context, it'll be like an example of a successful pivot, um, or, you know, why back founders, not ideas or something like that. But I actually think there's some technical content there that's worth considering. So uh, the piece of code that was carried over from Glitch the Game to Slack the Product was actually a founder of Sergey Morachev's um, Java server, the game server. It was the thing that sort of was on the other end of the socket. And it gives you the sense of, on the other end of a web socket, it gives you a sense of real-time presence. Hmm. It gives you green dots for the people in your, your organization that are there. It terminates SSL for short round-trip things. Um, and it's also the, the thing that's, that's pushing stuff out to you. And I think both Slack and most games are trying to be virtual places one way or another. This is before we talked about metaverses. Um, but you do, even though Slack is textual and, and doesn't sort of geometrically represent the world, mm -hmm. um, you want it to feel like the people in your Slack channel are kind of there with you wherever there is. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes down to a bunch of sort of considerations around just latency and trade-offs you make around, um, you, you know, doing some ugly things up front to make sure that, uh, that the real-time interaction is, is sort of nice and smooth. One of the really interesting ways you could see the game DNA in early Slack was that classic Slack basically had a loading screen. It kind of was, you know, it, it, it would download a big image of the world, which was everything that everybody's doing and all the new files that have been posted and all the messages you missed and all the everything else. Um, and kind of, you know, animate a cute little screen while it did that. Um, and eventually people realized that, that that's not what people expect from an enterprise app. So that, <laughs> that kind of game-like element, um, you know, wasn't well tolerated in that environment. Interesting, of course, Discord is, uh, has tried to retain more of that as, as sort of the non-corporate communications platform that, although interesting that it has, you know, been adopted not just by games, but a lot of crypto projects and things like that that I've observed. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, uh, one of the ironies of my life is that I stay in touch with my 15-year-old son with a Slack clone, right, the, with Discord. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's funny because uh, one of the uh, one of the things you mentioned, Keith, the sort of virtual place. Uh, one of the things that we do at Beamable is we use Discord quite a bit for like um, being able to pop into pop in and out of meetings. So like there's the voice channels which you can pop in and out. I think Slack has created a version of this now, but there was this really sort of powerful notion of like, oh, people are here and there's a co-working space voice channel where you know you can. It, it just felt more real time and it felt more more like you know a, a game um and that was very appealing to us as yeah. game developers yeah. and, and business as business people yeah I th and i think there's a tendency to talk about that as being sort of fun or being a part of an entertainment product but there's also lots of other cues that you know people rely on low latency for communicating effectively right um there i think one of the things there's lots of reasons that zoom fatigue became kind of such a thing during the pandemic but one of them was this that that uh, stop and start pattern of like negotiating when I'm done talking and when you're ready to talk or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do that in real life because like speed of light's fast and speed of sound is fast and um, we don't have those problems as much. And, and the extent that you can kind of circumvent that, even in a textual medium, I think it ends up mattering. I w I'm just curious, maybe this is a question for anybody watching, post in the comments or let me know, but like, it seems strange to me that we straddle multiple messaging platforms. We use Slack and Discord, and we don't even mm -hmm. use one of them for one use case or another. Like, right. like literally, Ali will Slack me a text message, which is, hey, I'm in Discord. Will you come into a video chat session with me? And like that, I that seems like a very bizarre use case. So someone tell me if we're the only weirdos doing that. Um, and I don't know, why is that, Ollie? Why do we, why do we straddle multiple things? It's because it's so hard to switch from one to another once you've adopted it. Uh, well, I, so super totally, totally, <laughs> totally. And I mean, you talk a lot about the decentralized metaverse. There it is, <laughs> being able to jump between the different uh, <laughs> apps. Uh, but I think, I think Keith uh, hit the nail on the head there, which is the low latency aspect of like, 
funny enough, it's like faster for me to say, John, I'm on Discord and John to click on the voice channel and be there than for me to click call John and get that pop up. That's like, you're calling John, you're calling John, you're calling John. Oh, John answered or John didn't answer. So like, I don't know, something about that feels more human about just saying, hey, I'm in the I'm in the meeting room. Join me when you're ready. Well, yeah, we kind of forget, by the way, that the, that, that voice, I'm sorry to interrupt you there, John, but that voice mechanic of the call, right? The idea that you call somebody, you interrupt them, they pick up and so on. Like this is, partly is literally mediated by, you know, the hardware that we implemented telephone networks with, right? That was, you were physically reserving a loop of copper that connected your telephone to the other person's telephone for most mm-hmm. of the 20th century. Um, and that was like a negotiation, right? You and, and you were using a precious resource that the phone company didn't have enough of as soon as you did that, right? Um, and that's just sort of not really true anymore. Hmm. Well, let, let's maybe go back to the scaling question. I'm really curious in the case of Slack, what were the big problems? If there were problems, what were the challenges or whatever? And in, in keeping up with the incredible growth that Slack had as a platform, like it seemed like there's this period of time yeah. where like everybody was moving off Skype and stuff like that. We were a Skype user before then, and we moved to mm-hmm. Slack because it was so much better just as our daily use cases. And mm-hmm. then suddenly the whole world was using Slack. So what, what kind of stuff came up in the context of that? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting point, by the way, is there were kind of competing products, right? There was Skype, there was HipChat, there was um, you know this, this world of other stuff that filled a superficially similar niche. And I think there were kind of two, whenever you talk about scaling, there's a tendency to pretend that scalability is sort of a single topic or that, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that there's, that you get these, you know, guys with gray beards who are overweight who write C++ and now you can scale things because we got the scale people, right? And um, I think there's like a, you always have to talk about which dimension you're scaling. And I think with Slack, there's a really clear kind of discontinuity around early Slack and sort of, um, let's say, adolescent, you know, kind of still growing into enterprise version of Slack, um, where very early Slack was scaling in this dimension of there are more teams, right? There are more and more teams every day. People are starting up, more and more companies are adopting us. Um, Early Slack marketed itself as being for small teams, as being for people who are 50 or fewer. Um, You can still find like decks out there where where they sold it that way Um, or pitch decks that describe it this way to investors too. And, um, in the early days, that, that characterized the growth really well. It was basically small companies and small teams within large companies adopting Slack. And that was a kind of horizontal growth in the number of teams where uh, the early Slack team, and I think most of the hard part of this, by the way, was solved before I started too. So uh, whenever I'm talking about Slack, like it's never just my story, right? Like uh, even if I'm there at the time, like it's a big group effort, but this kind of predates me. So super early Slack, uh, we're adding tons and tons of teams every week. Um, we are basically using kind of uh, horizontal scaling, you know, playbook from from web applications, right? So we're adding more web servers. Um, there are stateful services involved too. Most important, the database. Um, at the time I started at Slack, uh, had been in my SQL shop for the whole time. It was there, so it was uh, application level sharding for my SQL. There was a a kind of hash app table, a metadata table, essentially that told you which shard each team was on, right? So. The idea here is that you had some horizontal number of MySQL servers uh, and basically a hand balanced allocation of which teams are on which MySQL servers. And there would become, you'd find hotspots, right? Because there's too many teams on server 17. And so an operator would, you know, get an alert, take a look at that and have a bunch of scripts that kind of migrates you over to some less populated chart. Um, there, uh, so let me pause there for one second, right? That was kind of early Slack. This is modestly effective. There were a bunch of outages related to that shard out table. Um, that was literally one MySQL uh, master master pair. Um, we use MySQL in a way that, that it sort of isn't intended to be used, by the way, where you can write both halves and both halves are right, replicating back. But the application knows to write the odd rows on the left side and the even rows on the right side, roughly. Um, and uh, so, so these were all pairs of machines, these logical shards. But that one that was the hash app that tells you which customers on which shard was actually one machine. Um, so there's a single point of failure. It came to sort of dominate the causes of outages, um, you know, in the year before I started, I would say. Um, 
And around that time, the challenge started to shift a little bit. There were still lots and lots of, of new teams being formed, but we were good at forming new small teams now. Um, now the hard thing was that there were these teams that are large. If there are teams that have 100 people or 1,000 people or 10,000 people or in the fullest of time, 100,000 people. Um, maybe they've gotten 2 million since I left. Um, and all of a sudden, it's not going to make sense to just have all of their data on one pair of MySQL machines. Um, and you can kind of, you know, th there's a playbook of kind of um, half measures that, that get you a long way there of just sort of putting more cash in front of things and stuff like that. We did all that stuff. Um, but the kind of strategic play there was a migration to Vitesse, which is a, a application, uh, a kind of um, aggregator, shard, you know, leaf aggregator pattern uh, layer for MySQL that lets MySQL act kind of like distributed database the way people use cockroach or something like that. Um, and there's a lot of asterisks and caveats, like you don't just sort of, you know, stand up a new instance of, of the tests and migrate everything in one fell swoop. It was an incredibly complex project. Um, there were hundreds of tables by the time we were undertaking it. Each table kind of required a strategy um, and to some extent required some software effort. Um, and I think during the pandemic, it finally happened. I think they finally started decommissioning the few remaining tables on MySQL. Um, but it was a you know, really complicated major project to get to the point where we could handle vertically scary customers. Um, there was also an assumption there, by the way, that uh, the customer data doesn't stays in separate streams, right? which is true for a lot of enterprise SaaS applications is never true for games, essentially, right? If you're an online game, the whole point of it is that you're going to interact with other users. Um, and it came to not be true of Slack either, right? Slack sort of ended up having multiplayer channels or what we called network channels uh, in the last few years. And, you know, those channels belong to more than one team and more than one customer. That, that's one of my favorite features on Slack, the shared channels, absolutely, between multiple organizations. Mm -hmm. makes so many things easier. Actually, we use that to manage a lot of our customer communication. It's uh, so yeah, makes sense that you that the company eventually got there. And you can imagine by the time that came along, there had been I'm sorry, John, there have been years and years of people just assuming, you know, that customer data doesn't interact. And so there were an unbelievable, you know, amount of stuff to unwind in the application code and the data layer. And um, you know, it was a really heroic effort that team deserves to be really proud of. Sorry, John. Oh, I was just going to make an interesting anecdote where I, I recently spoke to one of the designers from World of Warcraft, and what he explained to me was, hey, you know, World of Warcraft is really primarily a chat room, and then we give, right. people, do, we give people things to do inside the chat room to talk about. That's kind of like <laughs> what he... <laughs> no, that's a great, that's a really great trick. Of it. Very different scaling issue because they didn't have like, you know, thousands and thousands of people in a room you kind of have like a big big server like orgamar probably had hundreds maybe you know a thousand ish kind of players at a time because they had this easier way to segment out the groups across different servers and chat groups and dungeon instances and things like that but ali we have scaled up some games you and i in the past uh in which we had things like chat rooms that actually did have to have like millions of concurrent users or at least millions of users in the same shared space interacting with each other. We didn't compartmentalize. There was like world chat and Game of Thrones Ascent and Star Trek timelines and stuff. But anyway, I'm not trying to get you to talk about our chat implementation so much as what, what did we learn about scaling up a game and how is it different than some of the things that Keith was just explaining? Yeah, it's uh, it's a deep. Where is it? Where is it different? Well, I think in some ways it's the same, and in other ways it's different. I th I think in in the, the, in the ways that it's the same is if you can get away with a fleet of stateless, you know, application servers that will you know you send requests to and respond, and they respond, and th then that's great. Like you can achieve massive scale. A lot of the top biggest tech companies out there do that, but you get to a certain point especially in games, especially in multiplayer domains, especially in areas where, you know, there is this kind of the data, the, I guess the way that I would put it is the, the shape that the data takes in the database, which, you know, Keith put it, uh, called, called the database essentially a state, stateful service. Uh, 
the, the, the way that it takes that it takes shape in MySQL or Mongo is not necessarily the shape that you want to deliver to the end user. And so this disconnection creates a lot of, you know, if, if you sort of let leave the data in that shape, then you have to do a lot of transformation, oftentimes a lot of computation. Sometimes you abuse the database by writing really, really complex queries that put undue pressure on it. So you end up in this place where you kind of have to decouple the data representation in quote unquote cold storage in the database versus the version that you that you um, you deliver to, to players. One example of this that we ran into was leaderboards. So leaderboards, the optimal access pattern for leaderboards is essentially a red and black tree. So typically what you're doing is you're accessing a sorted set of users and you're, you're selecting slices of that data and that data may be arbitrarily deep. And so being able to, to sort of say, I want help all players from score, you know, 2,567 to five, five, you know, 500,000, whatever, um, you know, that's, that's going to be a different data access pattern than what you're used to in the database. So one of the things that we've had to do is to essentially have the data live in one format in the database. And then when it gets loaded, we had these stateful actor like services that would organize the data into a red and black tree. That way you get optimal read and write access patterns. So the reads will read from a red and black tree and the writes will basically in the database, it'll store a single, very small document, which represents your player ID, your score, and which leaderboard it's attached to, right? So the write is very small and very efficient, and the read is very efficient because you've already gone through the, the trouble of organizing the data and its optimal pattern. So those are the kinds of things let's, you start to run into. Let's describe that a little bit more because the leaderboard example is a super interesting use case, which actually also shows you how the fundamental data store technology can actually vary a lot in what it's actually what its optimal use cases are. So like if you tried to do a 10 million user leaderboard ranked in a MySQL database, for example, that's just not going to work that well. And then the... So I think I, I'm curious about like, I, I'm not trying to be a, a jerk here, but like B trees work pretty well, right? Like uh, if you build an index on that score column, like MySQL will slap a B tree on it, which is, you know, the block structured cousin of your red black tree. Um, I mean, it's, there's probably more to this story that I don't appreciate, but I'd be really curious. And I was also not a Mongo expert, by the way. So yeah. there's a different story with Mongo. Um, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Uh, and, and that's a good point. You know, you're, you're not gonna, here's the thing, like you can get away with it and you'll get something that looks okay. Right. Like, especially with MySQL. MySQL is, is the ultimate, very versatile, general purpose, you know, database in many ways. And so you put an index on it, you can do that. There is a part of this story that I didn't, I didn't mention. One of the things that we found in games is that oftentimes players, uh, developers want to attach more than just, um, than just the score to that particular entry. They might want to attach additional metadata. So there's also a certain amount of filtering that may want to happen on the basis of that metadata. So now you end up having to have either compound indexes or multiple different kinds of indexes um, if you if you're trying to do something like that. So uh, so that that's where right. things start right. to fall apart. So like you can get a an okay solution. And for the record, like there are databases that are really good at this. Redis is an example of a database that's really good at sorted set leaderboard like access patterns, and, and that'll work. That'll work quite well. The problem is now you've expanded your maintenance surface area and you've added a, a sort of a special purpose database to your stack. Unless, of course, you're using Redis for other things as well, which today one of the popular things you can use it for is service discovery. So uh, there are situations where people really love Redis and will use that. But we, we actually wanted to reduce our maintenance surface area and we wanted to sort we wanted to accommodate not just sort of the basic use case, but some of the more advanced use cases that some of the games have, like the the sort of multiple sorting on the basis of metadata, the the attachment of arbitrary key value pairs to the, to the leaderboard score. Um, idle games are actually a great example of situations where not only do you have leaderboards being an important part of them, because the sort of basic premise of idle games is you sort of take certain actions and values accumulate whether you're playing or not, uh, those values kind of you have to extrapolate where they will be in the future. And so you, you're forced to store like velocity data alongside, you know, the, the leaderboard score to say not only is the score, you know, 2000 at the last snapshot, 
but it's growing at a rate of 100 per second. And the last time it was updated right. was this particular timestamp. So at time, you know, a day from now, it will be not 2000, but it'll be some number, right? So like that kind of metadata can also be attached to, to leaderboards. And this is kind of like the more advanced use cases that we've seen um, for, for leaderboard utilization. That's, that's a really interesting one, right? So you kind of know, in some ways, you know when it's going to change. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, like you know when some range of it might yep. um, I had a bunch of kind of concern, like questions along there too, which is this pattern of, of having like a in memory view of something um, that is optimized around some some application level pattern, right? And whether whether the quibble with the leaderboard makes sense or not, like there's going to be some version of something somewhere where you need an in memory view where it adds a lot, right? Search services are like this, right? Like an information retrieval is something where you're not going to just slurp it off the database every time somebody types a query, right? Um, and then you have what you know systems people call the cache coherence problem or or the view maintenance problem, I guess, that from the, from the database point of view. And you have to do something to make sure that your view stays coherent when the underlying data changes. And um, does Beamble have like a governing philosophy there or anything? Like, how do you do that? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question. Um, I'll try to keep this light uh, on top in the in sort of the Beamable specific material, but. Uh, um, but it, it, the short answer is it kind of depends on the service and the use case. Like certain services we have have these materialized views that are you know in memory and loaded at a specific application. We have essentially a, a homegrown actor system where that object lives in at most one place in the cluster and requests are deterministically routed to that one place. And if the cluster rebalances because you've added a few more, then the object may remain or it may migrate to another uh, to another instance. And that all happens transparently and very quickly, and you never really have to notice. Um, so there are situations um, where um, where you know you're gonna you're gonna have something a little bit different. So to 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 point um, to sort of step away from the leaderboard example, uh, chat is another example of this. And one example that that's a little bit interesting is you don't just global chat is actually not a very good idea, generally speaking. Not just in terms of from a technology perspective, but from a human perspective. You've got 10,000. Yeah, it's a bad product. It's yeah, a product yeah. you think you want to build, and then you build it, and you're like, oh, right. Yeah, exactly. You're in a room yeah. with 10,000 strangers. You don't know who these people are. They may start cursing. It's a content nightmare. It's a community. The screen's flying by. You can't read it anyway. Yeah, exactly. 90% yeah. of it is spam messages telling exactly. you to go to a gold farming site or something like that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> one thing that is actually super valuable and one of the things that we see in a lot of games is group chat, also known as guild chat, right? So like this is an example of a situation where, you know, you, you're in a guild and the chat service needs to know that you're in a guild and it needs to essentially automatically manage whether you have access to the guild channel or not. So there is a way uh, on the Beamable side where it can subscribe to state updates from guilds. And this, these objects will essentially, when they get loaded up into memory, they'll know, not only will they, they won't have to necessarily poll, uh, they'll get an event, an evented update that's published by the by the specific guild that you belong to that says, hey, by the way, Keith has just joined our, our um, you know, our, our guild and you need to now update uh, uh, Keith's um, uh, permissions. So like this this sort of subscription uh, paradigm can be useful for situations where you've got a lot of um, of these of these sort of materialized states that may be interested in each other. Um, they can subscribe to, to sort of updates from uh, from states. So yeah, yeah. Ollie, just to, to kind of bring it back to the broader picture of games. Like I, I think it would be helpful for everybody to understand a little bit more of like what does the life cycle of a game look like when you start building a game and then you start having users and then you go into like a soft launch with an expanded beta group and then eventually you ship a game and there's a bazillion people that show up. Just because there's so many game studios out there that are getting funded right now. Some of them are trying to do this stuff for the first time. Um, you don't always have the resources of, you know, we talked about World of Warcraft. They've sunk hundreds of millions of dollars into fundamental infrastructure to do some of this stuff. But like, take us through, like, without like turning the whole conversation into a dissection of like product lifecycle stuff in games. Like, encapsulate us for us. Like, what what? How do things begin and, and what are the big shifts that occur over the course of a game that kind of affect scalability either from like 
end user standpoint or from team dynamics yeah totally data store all that stuff yeah totally so i'll start by saying like scalability tends to be heavily act anchored as a term in technology but it's not just about technology it's about people too it's about how can your your organization scale effectively right and certain tech stacks are really great at scaling you know for or, or well suited to human beings and others are not well suited to human beings they're actually terribly suited to human beings they're brittle uh problems are introdu easily introduced and so forth and so on. So uh, I'll start by saying like one of the things uh, just to sort of rewind, the first thing that you're doing is you're building a game. And then the second thing that you're doing is you're operating your game, right? Like those are the two, the two major things that you do. And when you're in phase one, which is you're building your game, your goal is to try to get across the finish line and ship your product as quickly as possible. Because anybody who's, you know, built products either professionally or in a hobbyist capacity knows that, you know, it's super hard to ship something, right? So just being able to get across that finish line is super important. So that, you know, that that is subdivided in a lot of things and games today. Generally, that means you're not going to be building all of the technology yourself, right? You're going to be grabbing from off the shelf components. Um, today, it's fairly rare for people to build their own game engine components, to build their own physics layers, to build, they, they'll take, usually take a game engine like Unity or Unreal off the shelf and they'll start building on it. Um, and, um, and so once they, the sort of John, you I'm sure can, can speak to the sort of early game design and game development phases, right? Like there's all the prototyping and the sort of ideation and finding the fun and all of that stuff. And then there is the exercise of, you know, actually making a viable business product, right? Because when we're talking about games right now, we're not just talking about something that is an artistic exercise. We're talking about something that can be sustainable and actually game, game, give game developers, you know, a uh, ability to make a living. So anyway, fast forward. Yeah, that, that finding the fun phase, that finding the fun phase, the real important thing at that stage is rapid iteration, right? So I call it shots on goal. Like game development to me is all about shots on goal. It's trying things, trying game systems, settling on what the core mechanic is that's going to make it fun. And then within the game, Again, iterating at a feature level very quickly. And then ultimately, if your studio is successful and you've got multiple games, you know, it's being able to have a portfolio of products and repeat that a pattern across multiple games. So it, getting slowed down in the process of development is sort of the worst thing you can do because the game development is all about trying things because so many, you, you often just don't even know what's going to work. I mean, it is a bit of a black art. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's why getting to that sh finish line is super, super important, not just from a... In application world, this is this is product market fit or whatever. Yeah, right? exactly, the, exactly. You, know, you don't know if you built something valuable yet, and so you just need to be able to, to optimize for, for speed. Yeah, that's right. And the thing... That, and feedback, the thing to, right? You also need to know whether it worked or not. Keep going on. No, it's all sorry. good, it's all good. Uh, the, the thing to keep in mind is that like today when you're launching a game, like the beautiful thing about games is that it's a, it's a, it's a huge market. It's It eclipses the other media segments, it's growing by double digits, but also it's extremely competitive. And you're not just competing with your contemporaries, right? Like in the old days, you know, when I was a kid, I'd go to buy a, a video game, I'd go to a physical location, and the games that, that would be on the shelf would be competing essentially with games of the same year, right? Or the same sort of general time period. Today, you're competing with games that are in some cases 10 years old, right? And games that are still going strong, right? Like the, the, the super cells of the world, they've invested you know, millions of dollars. They have talent forces you know, in the hundreds. They've been able to sort of build these really competitive, these really successful games and who, that have been able to stand the test of time. So like, that's your competition. And so when you're entering the market, you, the, the, the player base is less forgiving from the get go, right? Like, whereas uh, 10 years ago, you know, a handful of mobile games, you'd get a feature from Apple and you'd be all of a sudden a huge success. Today, Apple is not gonna feature you as willingly, or if they do, it goes less far. Um, and and who and the, the companies you're competing with are, are obviously well-established. So you wanna, you wanna get out can, there. Can I ask you? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, let, oh. Let, let's keep going with the, with the product life cycle a little bit more though, because so the early, early stages is like the find the fun, rapid iteration. You don't want anything that can slow you down. But then something happens in the life cycle of almost every game. So today, almost all games are a live game in some way. It doesn't necessarily mean you've got some deep in-app economy or something with virtual goods. Sometimes that's the case. 
it might be as simple as having social elements wrap around your game or content updates. So every game is live and sort of built around cloud-based inf infrastructure in some way. So what that typically means though, is a couple of things are happening in, in the process of game development that I've seen myself, that I think we've seen you know, practically all of our customers at Beamable face, which is, okay, you go from this find the fun stage to suddenly your team size is growing a little bit, and now you have more non-engineers entering, entering the process, more game designers, more artists, more content creators, play testers, QA. So the team is kind of growing out like that. But at the same time, you're having to like keep up with like tooling, content management. You might be opening it up to end users who are coming in for the first time. And so many teams like grind to a halt at that stage. Like it goes from this super rapid find the fun process to like a small percentage of the speed that you had before. What, what do you think impact? Why is that? And, and how can people mitigate that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, in a nutshell, it, it comes down to, it comes down to the workflow. I mean, you know, when, when you're, when you're iterating, when you're trying to make rapid changes, when you're trying to scale your team, and now there's multiple people making rapid changes, you have to make sure that your game's architecture can stand up to that, right? And that's that's really where things start to sort of either force you in a direction where you're refactoring, and that doesn't feel good because the last thing you want to be doing is refactoring the game when you're trying to, you know, ship the game, um, or um, or or you're just kind of eating this constant pain, uh, you know, where there's sort of um, you know, conflicts with other team members, too many people sort of in the kitchen. Um, so I think, I think arriving at a, at a decent architecture where your content is separate from, uh, from sort of your application logic is not just important in terms of allowing designers to be, to design and allowing engineers to engineer. It also get, is going to sort of set you up for the, the next phase of live operations where you can sort of deploy content over the wire and all of that kind of stuff. So that architecture component Oftentimes, you know, seasoned game developers will know what to do uh, right off the bat. And people who are, you know, just getting started, they might have to eat that pain quite, you know, quite painfully for a long time um, in that first game that they ship before they arrive at something that feels right at, at the right size team. And getting to something, if I can. Go ahead. I'm sorry, guys. I sort of yeah, like no, kind no. of uh, grab something out of this area that I'm curious about because I think this is actually. One of the interesting differences in practice between what I experience as a game consumer and what I expect as a consumer web applications. Mm -hmm. So sometime in like 2004, 2005 or so, there came this consensus with sort of what became called Web 2 that like you should never be down, that there was no such thing as downtime planned or otherwise. No matter what, you want to ship new features, great. You turn them off in the client, you ship the client, you wait until every client in the whole wide world is ready to use the new feature. You start gatekeeping it on in the back end and so on, right? Um, and yeah, that's a sort of, seems like a slower way to develop a feature, but it gets you to feedback quicker and it keeps the site up, right? Um, but I experience as a game consumer all the time that there still are sort of planned and unplanned interruptions in the service of, you know, pretty popular, pretty visible games. And I, I, there's a glib answer here, which is like, well, that's an entertainment product. And, and so people tolerate that. But like, Facebook's kind of an entertainment product and like Instagram is kind of an entertainment product, right? And, and they still don't have the attitude that that's tractable. They're, they're worried that competitors are going to come eat their lunch if they're down, right? Um, why is, is that technical? Is that cultural? Is it path dependent? Is it the market? Like what's going on here? It's a really good question. Uh, I'll speak uh, to, a, to a, a narrow example. Um, for the longest time, um, for the last, you know, let's say it's gotten better over the years, but for the last 10 years, which has really forged the beginnings of mobile application development and mobile games development. If you're launching a mobile game in particular, um, you're going to be submitting your app to Apple and Apple is going to take days or weeks to review your app and they might deny it right. at that moment and say, go back home. You've missed this little thing. And then you have to repeat that submission process all over again. So that, that has forged certain attitudes and it has forced games to sort of uh, adopt a certain mindset in terms of how they manage application life cycles as well as, as well as how they manage content delivery. So on the one hand, as far as content delivery, 
what you're describing is not absent from games. Like there's plenty of games out there that slow roll features. Like actually having some kind of an over the wire content update, also commonly known as remote config in the games, um, you know, sort of ecosystem allows you to say, well, you know what, I'm going to create a segment and only 5%, everybody who's in this segment is going to get this new feature. And that's only 5% of the, of the ecosystem. So, so that does exist, but equally sort of uh, challenging is if you have a multiplayer game, and let's say you've got some rules where like a character has a thousand health, right? And you and I, you, me and John are all playing that same game and we all have the same character that has a thousand health. Now the, now the developer has to, you know, um, they have to, to sort of change that health from a thousand to 2000. Well, now they're forced with a conundrum of like, either I fragment my community where, you know, a portion of players will now be playing with a subset of other players or, um, or I just kind of bite the bullet and I say, everybody's got to update and now we don't have sort of a heterogeneous gameplay experience. Everybody's kind of playing the same kind of people. So, and you take that mm -hmm. that example and you compound it times a thousand because it's not just one character, it's like dozens of different changes. So um, so some people still try to achieve this, but um, but but sometimes the, the sort of easier path is just to say, you know what, I'm gonna force update my app and everybody has to take the new app and I'm gonna accept that and that's okay. And there's mm -hmm. gonna be some churn and, and that's fine. So. Um, so yeah, anyway. Ali, you're also talking about, I think one of the really important distinctions between a web-based application and a game as well. And we can talk about mobile apps, which sort of straddle, straddle both worlds in a, in a lot of ways, but web-based apps, it's a very, very thin client, essentially. The, the client is your web browser and everything is essentially up in the cloud to begin with which has a lot of advantages mm. over say a game, which is mm. typically shipping a binary and not only one binary, but multiple binaries for different kinds of users. If you're cross platform, so you might have an Android binary, an iOS binary, a PC binary, all interacting with this different back end. So dealing with all those content changes and updates and data synchronization, all of that stuff just enters into this whole other world of complexity that um, which is actually already a pretty hard problem or a complex problem for web apps, but then you kind of add this whole other dimension on top of it with games. I mean, in practice, nobody delivers an app just over the web anymore. Like all of these apps also have Android and iOS clients at the very least, um, and a bunch of desktop clients now too. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious. Like, like I think there's a. Lot, it makes sense that the client delivery dynamics are really different. I'm super curious about like what seems to me to be back end downtime, right? Like the, you know, or at least what I seem to experience as back end downtime. And maybe it's just associated with kind of the, the kinds of, you know, globally changing the rules of play or something kinds of updates you're describing. That's, that's a big part um, but of it. To me, it looks a little bit like the way we used to do client server apps where you just, you know, the IT department that your company would say, hey, be sure not to access the payroll thing over the weekend because we're upgrading it. And, um, and that's kind of, we, we have better ways to do backends now. And, and it seems like that's unevenly adopted in the game community. And maybe I'm wrong about this. No, you're not wrong. In fact, there's a lot of games out there that don't have a backend at all. And those that do have a backend, you know, they, 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 they want to make certain trade-offs that, uh, that are a little bit different. But I, I think um, one, one of the interesting things you said was the uneven player experiences. There's also community backlash to keep in mind, which is, I think a lot more severe from the games industry like because especially yeah. when people are purchasing things in the app and in free to play games that's often you know a significant percentage of the player population being you know we mm -hmm. we when we operated games like we've seen situations where like literally a person one segment of the population will get like a special offer and there'll be a lot of community backlash why did those people get it and i didn't get it right so like that's also part mm -hmm. of the equation there's a community management exercise that that can be uh, that can be very detrimental to a game if you get it wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, we haven't talked much about Facebook, but I was at Facebook for seven years also, and in some ways that straddles kind of some of these worlds, right? You bring back the old Facebook was kind of an internal right. joke meme, right? Which like every feature you ship, you get that response essentially, but and it uh, literally is information free, right? Like there's no way to interpret that response because everything <laughs> you do is the response. Bring back the old Facebook. Um, so yeah, you, and, and that's sort of one of the genesis of the very like data driven culture there, which is like, well, yeah, they're saying bring back the old Facebook, but they're saying it on Facebook and they're 20% <laughs> more engaged than they were last month. So let's not bring back the old Facebook or whatever, right? 
Um, and uh, that's a, you know, probably a, an anecdote for another time, but it reminds me a lot of what you're saying with the community backlash stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I guess different from bring back the old Facebook, uh, this isn't just who, you know, who moved by cheese. This is actually players churning. So it sounds like uh, that's worth worrying about. I, I think though that the, the point I was getting at with the multiple application, the multiple binaries, uh, you're right. Like these days, like mobile applications sort of wrap around the same web application uh, and then need to be synchronized with it. But my observation anyway, correct me if I'm wrong, either of you, is a lot of mobile application development has sort of gr- has been the natural outgrowth of a lot of web stuff. So a lot of sort of the synchronization between data and various asynchronous updates of content and use even user interface patterns that can be brought to life across the different things that has developed kind of consistently in that ecosystem as opposed to game development where you've got this phenomenon of the different binaries but it's in 3d graphics engines you've got this very different mix of asset types like 3d models you've got real-time interactivity You've got user interfaces that more often than not are actually built within the 3D environment. And so everybody has created this very, very heterogeneous mix of UI technology, asset updating technology, backend technology that all kind of fits that together in the game industry because there hasn't been a lot of consistency in the patterns and the, and the systems around it. Like almost every live game company today has some big mix of like authoring tools and content updates, deployment processes, scripts, et cetera. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean that's an interesting perspective. And there's um I mean, for what it's worth, like GraphQL was a was a technology that's basically a a change in the pattern of front end and back end communications, right? It sort of makes the back end a little more flexible and makes it possible to kind of present more um at least to iterate a lot more on on possible new front-end ideas without back-end changes if you do it right um that kind of is uh is a technical solution to sort of an organizational problem right it's, it partly is caused by the fact that you know you can't ship a native binary more often than say every week if you really really push it right um mm-hmm. at the same time that you're running back end really quickly um the Rather than boring you with a bunch of details about like Slack or, you know, Instagram or something like that, I think, you know, every domain is really like has its thing, right? Every domain kind of like has its its crazy thing that seems impossible about it or that, or that seems impossible um, like when described to outsiders. I think the um, you're absolutely right that a lot of these things are... Um, that there's a set of a fixed set of patterns that, that are, have emerged for like the applications for the things that you can use on the web, but you can also use them on your phone or whatever. There's a cookbook of, of ways that you make those patterns work. And it's like, you know, web sockets, this and graph do all that. And, you know, rest this other thing and whatever. Um, that said, I think there are also like, we're living through a time where a lot of these things actually happened on mobile first, like Instagram is kind of the first super obvious example. Yeah. So it was a huge hit on phones. And really needed phones to be a huge hit. Um, same thing with like uh, the new audio, right? like the, the clubhouse, post clubhouse world. Um, you kind of needed ubiquitous good microphones and headsets, which kind of required AirPods weirdly, like even though that wasn't what AirPods were for. Like that's an uh, application class that kind of was engendered by new hardware. Um, so those are always coming. And I think they keep challenging kind of that cookbook uh, approach, you know, and if you're stuck to the cookbook, you're, you know, you're going to be limited. It's, it's a really good, it's a really good question, Keith. Uh, I mean, like I think about examples. I, I remember World of Warcraft had like the Tuesday maintenance window and that's like a really big company with more revenue than virtually any other game company. And yet they still took this you know, Tuesday maintenance period. And it, it just kind of, it, it's interesting. Um, I think there's one last thing, um, which is like, and I think you brought this up just, just a second ago. It's like, what's the difference between an app that starts out predominantly web and then evolves into mobile where it's like binary heavy 
versus something that starts off mobile native or binary native. Um, and what I mean by that is like a lot of games start off like with the binary. That's where they yeah, start, yeah. not with the back end API that that sort of supports it. They start with the binary and they sort of expand from there. So that might also be a key difference in terms of where, where your starting point inevitably sort of colors your evolution. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I wanted to maybe talk about a different dimension of this, which is like all the things that game studios are having to do that are very similar to what a lot of other web technology and mobile application technology companies have had to do to grow successfully over time, which is add capacity for DevOps and server engineering and deployment and AI and all this stuff. So I, I'm reminded that like in this recent acquisition that Microsoft is making of Activision, one of the reasons, and, and I think there's some other reasons that we don't need to talk about that they were getting acquired, but um, one of the principal reasons given was, you know, a company even the size of Activision was having a really hard time keeping up with all of the live services personnel, like that AI, the DevOps, the backend technology, the whole networking piece. Because today, essentially every game company is competing against Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, every for that same talent pool for scaling up all of that backend complexity that exists and development team complexity. And that's a really tough place to be in an industry that's now by far the biggest media industry, right? And you want to be able to have people get as big as a World of Warcraft Activision product, uh, but you also want to be able to have smaller teams be able to have a game that can scale up rapidly and i i'm reminded also of like the office so the office shipped on us very very recently like this is maybe a slight difference in the way games ship and then engage an audience than a lot of web stuff a lot of web stuff sort of builds in public to some extent mm -hmm. and kind of weaves its way to product market fit. And then when they start connecting, they build around that nucleus. Whereas mm -hmm. in games, the product market fit is established more in the earlier stages and where you're a little more secretive with alpha testers and be then beta testers. And then you start hyping the game because you want a ton of people and you go to Apple and you say, please feature me. And you, know, you, you suddenly have massive numbers of people on the first day so like the office like big ip like day one all the office super fans of the world are showing up so they're hitting like you know ten thousand api calls a second or something on, on the back end which you know mm -hmm. very easy to fall down in that situation they didn't get the benefit of like a kind of a organic growth right. curve right, what, right. what does that introduce ollie that and keith yeah, uh, one quick thing, which is a little bit interesting, uh, is that the bigger game companies or the ones with large licensed IPs are more likely to be in this phenomenon of everybody shows up on day one than the smaller indie games, which actually oftentimes launch their games and kind of we try to weave their way up the, the, the sort of rankings. Among Us is actually an example of a game that was around for years <laughs> before they hit it big, right? Like, whereas sort of The Office and the Supercell games like they literally put those games out there. They they start spending millions of dollars in paid advertisement. And if the game doesn't show up, if the if the, the audience doesn't show up in the first few months, like they axe the game, right? Like so so that's that's also sort of an interesting difference. But I'll I'll yield to Keith, let let him have a word. No, that's a that's an interesting point. I think there's there's lots of different adoption curves and kind of patterns of of growth. Um and they're I think the exogenous shock, or right, the sort of the pattern that is an exogenous kind of some some event in the world changes, or you should feature, or you change how the client works, or whatever, um, and so suddenly there's a step function up in, in the kinds of stuff that the back end is hitting is a pattern that happens. Um, I'm an advisor at Coinbase, for instance, and like there are kind of uh, like exogenous macroeconomic things that happen sometimes that all mm -hmm. of a sudden cause a flood of traffic to them, and especially like in the early days of this, like in 2017. There was an interesting induced demand phenomenon with them, which is like the more they could stay up, the more trading, the more appetite for trading there was basically, because the more they stayed up, the more the price moved because they were the only thing that was really driving the price. Um, so, uh, and, and that induced demand phenomenon is interesting. Like you have that with sort of network effect games possibly, um, 
And the, the area I'm like most familiar with it is very, very different, actually, which is just uh, data analytic systems inside of companies, right? If you kind of have a Presto or a system that lets you like gain insights into what's going on with your back end. Sorry, that pattern of like there's just a big step up is, is one of those things that happens. It's kind of an emergency whenever it happens, even in the context of kind of a going concern. Um, you want to understand why it's happening and want to sort of economically respond to it usually. It can be good news. And uh, like in the case of a game, right, this is a nice problem to have. This is the problem you have uh, of having hit on your hands, I hope. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about some of the technology patterns or, or approaches that people have been adopting to try to mitigate either these rapid demand curves in advance or in the case of like that Activision comment about like not being able to hire enough of the expertise to keep up with live services demand. So I, I'm just going to throw out a couple of terms. Serverless is one and microservices is another. That's just a couple of approaches people are thinking about. Let's just start with serverless. I want, first of all, let's define that. I, th I feel like in the web world, like a lot of people are very familiar with this and it's become a pretty significant approach to solving like DevOps scalability issues and things like that. And it seems still new for a lot of game developers for whatever reason, but let's maybe just start by defining it. Keith, do you want to just take a stab at like, what does that word uh, mean? Why should yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it the way that, that I understand it. I think of the word serverless as literally a white label slap on AWS Lambda, which is the product that introduced this pattern in a way that people care about. Um, and it means uh, that the way that you specify a service is as a literally a function to be called. Um, and behind the scenes, there are, of course, servers. Um, but if you tell AWS where the entry point to this function is, um, they manage the servers for you. And they, you know, there are little hooks for warming them up and starting them up and shutting them down and so on. And it's evolved past Python. It's still uh, pretty much more broadly adopted in Python than anywhere else that I know of. Um, and the, the glorious part of this is that it lets you, um, if you're doing it right, it lets you kind of forget about growing your application server fleet, right? The, the kind of promise of this is that um, people who specialize in worrying about traffic patterns and economically addressing spikes in load and all of these things are uh, going to be able to respond to this instead of operators that you page and pay. Yeah, t su super weird term that whoever coined this and got away with it called it serverless because there's totally, yeah. there's probably more servers than ever before in the background. Um, Ali, do, do, how do you feel about the de that definition? Would you add or vary anything, or it, or even just looking at it through the lens of like games? Is there any yeah. variation? Yeah, I'll I'll just uh, I think Keith's definition is is excellent, and I'll I'll add just one sort of specific thing, uh, which is it's a usage based model, right? Like whereas whereas server you know dedicated infrastructure, you're paying by the by the minute or by the second while that infrastructure is up and running. Whether it's being used or not, right? Whether it's seeing, you know, hundreds of thousands of requests per second or whether it's seeing nothing, you're paying for that infrastructure. For serverless, you're paying often, not only are, is it sort of a fleet that you don't manage and that AWS takes care of scaling, but you're also, the, the business model is different. You're, you're charged by the request typically. And then there is some additional um, additional sort of uh, dials there, like how much memory you allocate and, you know, how long the request runs for. Uh, so like some calculation of those three variables ends up being your bill uh, as opposed to, you know, hey, I've got some infrastructure running. So that that has some important ramifications, some implications, important implications. Like if you're if you don't have a lot of traffic, you pay nothing. Right. Which is which is great. Right. That's wonderful for somebody who wants cost elasticity in addition to be freed from the burden of DevOps. And you're also doing, if we take a step back and think of it in terms of like capital requirements, teams, things like that, server full, for lack of a better term, means you're signing up for a lot of DevOps. Specifically, you're going to be doing 24 by 7 monitoring. Someone's going to get up in the middle of the night. If there's a problem, fix it. You're going you're gonna to have to provision servers. You're going to have to scale them. There's just a lot, a lot of like dealing with the iron of servers from an economic standpoint, from a capital team standpoint, what are the advantages of a serverless approach to this versus 
yeah. a server full. Approach. Yeah, so a server full or, or dedicated infrastructure approach means that number one, you've got to go and configure a lot of stuff, right? There's a lot of stuff you have to configure, including load balancing, auto scaling rules, subnets, security groups. Like there's just a whole bunch of stuff that has to do with managing infrastructure, cloud or otherwise that you have to be mindful of and uh, and somebody who understands how to tune those things in a way that is a lot aligned with best practices not only in terms of cost efficiency but also performance and also um and also uh you know security so those are the kinds of things that you know serverless helps with now that's it it's not a panacea right like you're not going to be yeah. entirely fr- like you still have to author the code and you still have to figure out how to take that code from living on your computer to living on in the cloud and you still need to figure out how you're going to segment environments and how you're going to allow your sort of um you know your internal folks to do testing and validation and unit tests and you're still going to have to figure out debugging so like it's not it's not going to free you from the burden of deployment builds and um uh and sort of engineering just just generally speaking but it will help you out when it comes to specifically the act of devops of managing a a, a virtual private cluster or a physical cluster of machines provisioning servers making sure you can scale out to demand all of that stuff yeah and i'll say in particular there's one i i think this has been the serverless revolution has been sort of appropriately sold mostly. I actually think like it does what it says on the outside of the box. Um, but one thing that, that I think sometimes people do get tricked into being maybe a little over promised on is that they won't have to think about resource usage again. Um, right. So the reality is that like, while yes, that, that tier that is working serverlessly, right. That sort of whatever is in that operating mode, you have to do less manual intervention and less sort of pencil and paper planning around how big it is and when to grow it and how much to grow it. Um, you still will have these spikes in traffic. And the reason that application is useful is because it interacts with other things or is because it like reads data from databases and generates logs that go into logging systems and so on. And so gigantic weird spikes in traffic are still going to mm-hmm. affect your runtime operational environment in ways that you need to kind of understand and think about and, and even cause problems that, that can then be arguably trickier to go back and debug because there's sort of more magic surrounding um, the events that caused it. So and I don't think this is negative. Like on the net, I think it's sort of serverless is the right operational model for you. It's just so much cheaper um, that you'd be a fool not to, to try to yeah. do it. It's just that it doesn't completely liberate you from understanding how your thing works at runtime. Yeah, yeah and in particular, it also doesn't just give you license to not care about making performant code and stuff like that anymore because unless you don't care about getting a monster bill from amazon or something in which case your amazon account exec is going to be calling you all the time and and buying you you know sports stadium (laughs) tickets and dinners and stuff like that but other than that like um you know you still got to pay attention to how things are actually implemented on the back end as well right uh, You know, another part of that, too, though, like just before we move on to microservices, that other word that I raised was I think one of the people, one of the things people don't pay enough attention to in game development, and it relates back to this comment I made earlier about agility and shots on goal and stuff is so as you're building out a game infrastructure over time. And you start to add in all these auto scaling scripts and content management automation pipelines and all that stuff. Like people really underestimate the extent of the compounding technical debt that that ends up presenting to your organization. And I've rarely seen a company that can keep up with that effectively. And when that technical debt starts competing against the things players care about, like a new feature or content in the game, very bad place to be as a game developer and and a lot, often those choices are made very early on and it's so easy like i like i guarantee there's someone watching right now who heard someone in their set tell them hey just just make this little script like it'll take you an hour and like then we're then we solve the problem and then that one hour becomes a day and eventually it's like months and months of yeah. the time yeah. as it doesn't keep up with various aspects. There's the magical, can't you just phrase that every engineer sure. dreads. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've said that 
plenty of we've times. We've all so said I'm, it. I'm we've all said it. Everybody's yeah, guilty, but uh, but yeah. So serverless, the way I hear you describing it, it, it's sort of like a means of automating your deployment, your provisioning, things like that in a way that mitigates a certain amount of DevOps, doesn't completely eliminate it, and it doesn't eliminate thinking about what lives out in the cloud and your servers, it doesn't completely eliminate that, but it can cut down on a lot of the labor and the continuous monitoring things that you might ordinarily need to do. So I mentioned the word microservices as well, which is different than that. Like that's an actual way of building applications. Who wants to take yeah. a stab at, at that? Keith, you want to comment on yeah. microservices and what that means and why people should care about that word? Right. So, uh, and I should sort of say up front that I'm, uh, partly dine out on being a microservices contrarian, right? So I'm, I am your local monolith apologist. If you, <laughs> if you want to be talked out of your microservice transition, I am your guy to talk to. But um, the, the, the microservice revolution is sort of the extraordinary claim that the complicated computer program you have trouble developing and understanding needs to be uh, a complicated distributed system instead. And that that will make it easier to understand and deploy and change. Um, it's demonstrably right sometimes, but it's an extraordinary claim. And I, and I actually like put it in that, in those terms, because I do think it's an extraordinary claim. And I think you should go into a transition into it with uh, eyes wide open. I think the, one of the reasons it's sort of rare to see a super textbook adoption of microservices that is, uh, entirely successful and, and that everybody's entirely proud of and entirely happy about is that it doesn't make sense for small teams to start with it. It just tends not to, right? If there's four people, they're going to write a computer program. They're not going to write a bunch of, of services that talk to each other over a PC. Um, and then by induction, um, it's rare to take a working computer program and make it easier to reason about by applying the microservice discipline. Um, the times where it does, I actually think a lot of what you're doing is, uh, is actually relying on the RPC gap to impose a type system, right? Like, if you sort of identify some boundary inside of your application and say, oh, we could carve a service out of that, and then you like make methods and you, you say that this one will take this and it'll return that, and this one will take this and it'll return that. A lot of the folks that have the most powerful uh, persuasive microservice stories, they're in untyped languages with a multi-million line code base. And for them, like that discipline of just like this takes this and returns that actually really, really helps a lot. But we can do that at the language level now. And, and even if you are in, in Ruby or JavaScript or PHP, there is some gradual typing, you know, on ramp to doing that without doing the service decomposition. So I actually think microservices are, uh, and I'm sorry, this is like the longest answer ever. Like, we'll let it down to something that's not crazy. Um, I actually think of microservices like mostly as an organizational technology in a way, like more so than a computer programming technology. Like, as a raw bag of technical claims, I'm not sure it makes sense, but um, it fits the way that corporations that need to deliver big complicated things with relatively big engineering teams um, that only have finite capacity to understand what each other are up to and finite capacity to organize and synchronize. Um, I think for that, it's, it's a, it's an effective technology demonstrably, but um, it's tricky to sort of recommend it because it's sort of very contingent and it depends on, on, you know, who's doing what. So there's the most lukewarm kind of microservice. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but I think let, let's just to be clear on defining it for everybody as well. So, sure. but yes, it, it, it injects a certain amount of complexity, particularly for a small team to start organizing their application around it. But what's, what's a microservice? Uh, to me, a microservice is something with a well-defined API, well-defined inputs and outputs um, that is short of a self-contained application. It's not useful all by itself. Mm -hmm. um, but we, the idea is that we're going to build up um, a larger useful application out of these things. Um, and it depends on how micro, you know, like computer people really like to use the phrase micro when it's like, they mean centi or like deci, really. Like, I, I think, I, I, you know, I don't think anybody wants to break up your code base into a million services, right? Lam um, lambdas are more, or at least I'd like to, la that'd be a fun guest for your, if somebody wants to advocate. La lambdas deserve the name more in some ways. The next generation. Yeah. <laughs> What's I said lambdas deserve the name more in some ways. Like the 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 sort of individual function as the unit of work is it feels more micro than sort of the uh, yeah. 
But uh, yeah, I mean, you might literally have one million of them. Yeah. In some code bases in that case, maybe mm. maybe you're right. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll build on top of what Keith was just explaining to us, yeah. though. Both and react to like the complexity, the appropriateness, but you know, talk about games now. Yeah, totally. Why? Why? First of all. Is this appropriate for games, and and why would game developers want to consider it? Yeah, so uh, you know, I I honestly would say that games in general tend to be at the cutting edge of technology across kind of all, almost all vectors, whether it's back end or uh, or on the front end, game engine sort of extracting every ounce of resources out of the device. So um, so I would say yes, it is appropriate, um, and th to the same extent that it's appropriate, you know, elsewhere, um, and. Uh, I would say um, I would say I definitely agree with Keith on a particular point, which is like, you know, you can write a well-architected application that is a monolith with separation of concerns, the, the the correct sort of type separations at the at the application level that doesn't break them out into separate services. Like it's it's entirely doable, but humans are humans, and oftentimes, uh, what's there's some expression out there. I think I've, I've, there's some like. Uh, you know, software inherits the sort of corporate organization or something like that. Your application will end up looking like your organization, something along those lines. Um, uh, but um, I, I think that there is there is value in creating, you know, um, they're creating lines, right? In creating sort of nice encapsulated separations. Uh, so I would say, can you build a monolithic application that is as effective from a performance standpoint, from from in every standpoint as a, as a microservice? I would say you could probably build a monolithic application that is more performant and shaves off less, more of the overhead than microservices. But um, in terms of, of 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 having nice, clean separations, they can be extraordinarily powerful, layering it on top of the organizational layer, but also in terms of just having nice semantic separations where you can scale services individually, but also debug services individually. It's easier to know when you have a very large code base, which service is misbehaving if they are in separate applications. Um, but I would say uh, that um, that uh, that it's 100% true that um, development teams need not start there, right? They need not start with 20 different microservices and you know a bunch of overhead to build them into separate containers and deploy them and do all of that stuff. Now I'll add another thing, which is I think um, you know monoliths and microservices. You know I, I would say microservices were also dramatically enabled by containerization. So whereas before you know the deployment of applications as standalone binaries with a bunch of dependencies uh, was kind of a nightmare before containers, right? Like you had to have machines with pre-installed dependencies, and if you were to layer on top of that. A bunch of different microservices, each with their own dependencies, potentially depending on different library versions, potentially in different programming languages. You know, in the era before containers, that was almost prohibitive. In the era after containers, it becomes a lot more feasible, and it becomes not only feasible but convenient and very with very little additional cost from a from a sort of deployment standpoint. Um, so I would say I would say the era of containers kind of is is in some ways synonymous with the era of microservices. And that the big win for for uh, for um, for for microservices was this this container um, deployment. Um, now I'll add one thing which I didn't mention before um, because we weren't talking about microservices. But like serverless is a mode of deployment of applications. Microservices can be deployed in a serverless manner. In many ways, the lines between lambdas or or, or server serverless quote as it's used in a practical sense. And microservices is increasingly blurred in the sense that lambdas are a great example of a bunch of applications that are designed to be, you know, uh, deployed in a, in a very small atomic unit. Um, and uh, and additionally, microservices today with services like AWS Fargate uh, can be deployed in a way that you think of the container as the atomic unit in the same way that you would think as the function as the atomic unit for lambdas, right? Like you don't manage the underlying infrastructure. You deploy a container, and the scheduling of that infrastructure is handled by by a serverless stack. So that's also there is there is sort of a, a rapprochement between the, the sort of a they're coming closer and closer together, uh, right? Yeah. So uh, between yeah. between these two stacks, I would say. I, Ali, I just want to say, like, I really like the clarity around saying like serverless is a way of operating, and uh, that's a that's a wonderful way of, of describing things. There is some orthogonality here. And uh, and you're right that sort of discussions of this too often are sort of focused on either or. I also kind of want to point out. I mean, uh, you know, I 
have been fortunate to work at a bunch of software companies that had some success. And so like a lot of times people are, are want to know anecdotally, right? Like, okay, what, what practices did these places use that made them successful or whatever? And I, I sometimes get sucked right into being like, well, they use this practice and that practice. Um, and, and there are such things as good and bad practices to be clear. Like I think there are practices uh, that, that objectively make your job harder. Um, but uh, I think much more important than any of those practices is actually just an engineering ethos, just sort of really caring about making mm. awesome stuff and really being curious about whether it's working the way you think it is and um, really wanting to deliver something amazing. And that's, there's sort of good news and bad news, right? The bad news there is that if your team lacks that, um, it doesn't matter what process or tools you adopt, right? Like I think test-driven development is a good, is good, right? So it's a process that helps people deliver code that works. Um, if you turn TBD into a game that your team doesn't understand and we're trying to hit 100% line coverage on unit tests this quarter and nobody actually cares, um, you're going to get a bunch of unit tests that are traces of the way your application happens to work that don't actually give you any more confidence that it's staying correct as you change it. Um, because you, you, you approach this process without the right ethos, right? Like you approach this, this process or tool yeah. without the right intention, right? Yeah. And the, the good news of this is that it's actually catchy, right? Like the reason people got into computers is that they sort of have some like ability to be excited about doing awesome things. And having just a few people that, that uh, manifest that and that demand that of others can sort of rapidly spread through an organization. But I think that's enormously more important than, you know, whether you do continuous integration or whether you do TDD, whether yeah. you, you know, what monitoring stack you use or whatever. There's there's a lot of religious wars in the engineering world, right? Like, and, and it's what advance, and frankly, in some ways, that's what kind of advances each separate paradigm in a, in a meaningful way. People that care and, and, and believe deeply and, and want to do the right thing and 100% agree on the TDD. That's a great anecdote. I mean, certainly you can end up by you can end up in some ways following the letter of the law without following the spirit of the law, right? It's like, you know, if 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 your if your intentions are true and you're you're actually seeking the best possible topology for your application, then more often than not, you'll end up in a good place, no matter the paradigm. And and diving back into anecdote mode for a hot second, like the seven years I was at Facebook, there were two big code repos, uh, both mono repos, but like duo repos, if you like, right? One big repo was sort of the web front end application. This is the thing that knows what users are and posts are and what likes are and stuff like that. And that thing was an enormous monolith. Um, so they've talked about the number of 100 million lines of code in public before. So it's bigger than Windows, right? It's bigger than Office. There's really a lot of code in that monolith. Um, and the other uh, mono repo of sort of comparable size was a bunch of C++. We called them microservices now, but we weren't calling them microservices then. They were just kind of how we were doing things. Um, and by the way, we had to invent containers contemporaneously with Docker. There's an internal system called Tupperware that like, was a Docker lookalike that, that they built. Um, and both of those systems and teams were effective, right? Like, it's not as if Facebook's success is due to its adoption of microservices in this part or due to its use of a monolith in that part. Um, to the extent its success in those years was, was driven by technology at all, it was driven by the fact that everybody really wanted to understand this thing, really wanted to deliver something new and exciting and uh and useful right and when we failed to do so we were curious about why <laughs> and so uh, i think that has a lot more to do with with, with teams that, that are effective than, you know the language they use the you know mono repos versus little repos microservices tdd ci you know this this container the orchestration framework that container orchestration framework and so on um and i think you know that that's a that's not quite right tool for the job, right? That's uh, I'm not just being entirely. There is no, no, totally, totally. Here, which is yeah. ethos first. Yeah, right? ethos first. Yeah, awesome. I, I, I love ending on this topic of just curiosity and passion for the problem being solved, though, because the thing that I keep telling um, game studios that that I end up advising is, first of all, you have to be really passionate about not just the game because the game can change a little bit, but the audience that you're trying to solve for, like, and really find the path to fun and engaging. So like really get curious about that audience and understand what they care about and be a little less married actually to the game. Because if you're super interested in that audience and what they care about and what kind of joy they want to get from the experience, that's what will lead you to make some really intelligent decisions in the path 
of the game itself. Just like with Star Trek, we did we we did basically five different games until we ended up on the fifth. It ended up really connecting with the storytelling experience that both we wanted and and the the cut the um, customers of the game did. But that curiosity, I think, you know, is something that has to go through the whole organization. It's not just the game designers; it's the engineers; it's everybody who participates in that process. Um, and I guess what I want to really encourage people to think about, particularly on game development teams today, is start thinking about like planning for the success of your game a little bit earlier as well. In terms of making some great architectural decisions, think about like what are the amazing things that can happen to you when a million players show up in your first month, and also the horrifying things that can happen if that if that occurs to you because you should kind of explore both of that and some of the words we've used in this like containerization and serverless and microservices and and like the whole deployment process authoring provisioning all the stuff that goes into making a live services game i i really want to encourage people to start thinking about that a lot earlier in their game development process so that it's less of that compounding technical debt that you can get shots on goal, you can try a lot of things and, and ultimately delight an audience, not just at launch, but for hopefully the many years that you're going to operate the game. Oh, well said, John. Totally. Yeah. Well, Ali, Keith, thanks for joining in this conversation today. It got super technical relative to a lot of the conversations <laughs> that I have on building the metaverse, I, but I have a feeling it'll be super useful to people and... If you've stuck with us through this hour and 20 minute conversation and uh, you know a CTO that would benefit from some of this, definitely pass it along. And by the way, if you enjoy these conversations, subscribe down below here. We love having these conversations. I try to bring in people who are total experts in their field once or twice a month, whether it's technology like we've just done or design or the business aspects of all this stuff. I super enjoy these conversations and hope you do as well. So Ali, Keith, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Likewise.